Well, good morning. Thank you for attending Walden Church this morning. And uh, this, of course, is Thanksgiving week. And I want to read to you a passage from 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I think that's pretty easy for us when things are going well, right? We can give thanks when the circumstances in our lives are good. But it's far more difficult in the moments of our days when they are filled with grief or trial or despair. Perhaps we forget to say thank you when the circumstances in our life seem to overwhelm us. But that verse makes it clear that the gratitude that we ought to be expressing is not dependent upon circumstances at all. In fact, God's will for us is that in all things, right, we should be giving thanks to him. Not for all things. That's not what it says. In all things. And and there's a difference between the two. I think um, the difference between the two is perfectly illustrated in the life of Matthew Henry. Uh, Matthew Henry was a pastor. He was a Bible commentator. One day he got robbed. He got robbed, got mugged, and uh, he wrote these words in his diary. He says, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took all, It was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. Notice that his responses are to his circumstances, correct? But it's not that he's giving thanks for those moments. He's being being thankful in those moments, right? He, He wasn't thankful that he had been robbed, but having been robbed he found something to be thankful for. Did you know that the first recorded Thanksgiving in America happened in Texas? That's true. Uh, May 23rd, 1541. When Spanish explorer Francisco de Coronado and his men, they held a service of Thanksgiving after finding food, water, and pasture for their animals in the panhandle. Another Thanksgiving service accorded Uh, June 30th, 1564, when French Huguenot colonists celebrated in solemn praise and thanksgiving in a settlement, which is uh, what is now Jacksonville, Florida. And then later, on August 9th, 1607, English settlers led by Captain George Popham joined Abnaki Indians along Maine's Kennebec River for a harvest feast and a prayer meeting. The colonists living under the Plymouth Company Charter established Fort St. George uh, around the same time as the founding of Virginia's Jamestown colony. And then two years before the Pilgrims, on December 4th, 1619, a group of 38 English settlers arrived at Berkeley Plantation in what is now Charles City, Virginia. That group's charter required that the day of arrival be observed yearly as the day of thanksgiving to God, and when Captain John Woodleaf held the service of thanksgiving, he said, we had ordained that the day of our ship's arrival in the land of Virginia shall be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. And then, of course, we have the Pilgrims' Thanksgiving. You know why the colonizers first came to America? The good news is you don't even have to speculate. William Bradford wrote in his diary that the journey right, was motivated by a great hope for advancing the kingdom of Christ. The pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock on December 11th, 1620, and their first winter was devastating, weakened by a seven-week voyage and the need to build shelters. Most came down with pneumonia and consumption, and they started to slowly die. They dug graves at night so the Indians wouldn't see how quickly their numbers were fading, and at one point, there were only seven people who were able to take care of everyone else, to fetch wood, make fires. Uh, And by the spring, they had lost 46 people of the original 102 that came over on the Mayflower. The pilgrims obviously needed help, and it came from an English-speaking member of the Wampanoag nation named Squanto. Squanto decided to stay with the pilgrims 
for the next couple months and teach them how to survive. He brought them food and skins. He taught them how to cultivate new vegetables, how to build shelters. He educated the pilgrims on which plants were poisonous, which plants had medicine, how to get uh, maple out of the trees, how to use fertilizer, and a lot of other skills they needed to live. But it would be years later that George Washington proclaimed a national day of Thanksgiving. Uh, that was November 26, 1789, and he declared a national day uh, of thanks. Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams, uh, they did not continue that tradition. They thought that Thanksgiving infringed upon the separation of church and state. Later, during the War of 1812, President Madison proclaims three days of fasting and prayer, but he was the last president to call for a national Thanksgiving until Abraham Lincoln in 1863. So how did Thanksgiving become a yearly practice? Well, this woman, Sarah Joseph Hale, she was a magazine editor and her efforts led to what we recognize as Thanksgiving. Hale wrote a lot of editorials uh, championing her cause. She wrote in Boston Ladies Magazine and Gotti's Ladies Book. She was determined to have the whole nation come together in setting apart a day where there was thanksgiving to God. And by 1852, Hale's campaign had succeeded in turning 29 states to observe the last Thursday of November, of November as Thanksgiving Day. And then 10 years after that, <laughs> on September 28th, 1863, Sarah Hale wrote a letter to President Lincoln and urged him to create an annual Thanksgiving Day. And on October 3rd that same year, President Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday of November as a national day of thanksgiving and praise to our generous Father. And it's a good practice, perhaps a forgotten practice, right? Because Thanksgiving becomes the forgotten holiday as we transition from Halloween to Christmas. But I believe that when we practice gratitude, it's helpful because it changes the way we look at things, our own circumstances, could even change the world. Someone once said it like this, when I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. That's good for us, that we should maybe not focus on the circumstance itself, whether it's good or bad, and put our focus where it belongs. And it's only when we put our thanks in God that we begin to see that we can be thankful in all circumstances. So today I wanted to read a story from Luke 17 that I think goes well with our Thanksgiving holiday. Luke 17 verse 11 says, On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance, lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Folks, leprosy was an absolutely horrible disease. Easton's Bible Dictionary tells us that the disease begins with specks on the eyelids and on the palms. Gradually, it spreads over the whole body. It bleaches your hair white. Uh, wherever it starts to manifest, crusted uh, white scales appear on your skin, sores, uh, swellings. The skin uh, is covered with this this disease that works inward and it goes towards your bones and it basically rots your body one piece at a time. Not to mention that leprosy was also considered a sign of God's anger towards you. You are a sinner and God's, God's wrath is being poured out on you. So everyone is afraid of you because you have these deformities that are caused by the disease and we also assume that you are being punished by God. And so lepers were cut off from everyone, everything, outcasts. In Christ's day, if there was a leper, he could not live in a town that had a wall. He could live in an open village, but 
wherever they went, they had to have ripped clothes that were a sign of infection. They had to have nothing on their head so that you could see their hair. Uh, and if they were walking by someone, they would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, so that people would know. You weren't allowed to greet anyone or return a greeting. So in every sense of the word, these 10 men are outcasts. They're, they're cut off from their families and friends. They're exiles. They're forced to live apart from everything they know. And because they can't have any contact with anyone, that's why the Bible says, makes a point to say, stood at a distance, called out to Jesus, right, with a loud voice so they could be heard. What a picture of sin, right? What a great symbol because, because of sin, our relationships with one another is also destroyed. Our fellowship with God is also destroyed, separate, distant. And before we become Christians, through, before we have the, the blood of Jesus, we stand far off from God, right? And we are unable to approach him, unable to draw near. But then it's God's grace. Some, at some time in our life, it, it, it begins to convict our hearts. And then, just like these lepers, we have this recognition, right? We say to ourselves, I need something outside of myself. I need another agent outside of myself to help me. And we call out to God for help. And notice when they call out to Jesus, they don't call him teacher. They don't call him friend. They call him master. That's something we wouldn't expect. And that Greek word, it emphasizes authority, meaning that in Jesus they saw, this is the one who has the authority to take away my disease. This is the one who has the authority to make me whole, the authority to give me life. These are the very things that we need to see in Jesus before we can call out to him for our own salvation. We recognize that he is the, he is the thing we need. He is the master of our life. He is the one who can conquer our sin. And so these 10 had heard of Jesus. That's why they come. They came hoping for something, right? Longing for something. They're like, we want our lives to change. And then in Jesus, they're going to find the very thing that they're looking for. And then after they're healed, Jesus sends them on their way to show themselves to the priest. That's what the law requires. The priest can sign them off. The priest will inspect them make sure they're cleansed, and then they'll give them the kind of stamp of approval. And then those 10 could go back to their friends and families. They could go back to their homes. They could get their lives back. But the Bible says something interesting. It says, as they went, they were cleansed. That means they began to walk away from Jesus before he healed them. That probably took a lot of faith. But look what happens as they go. 10 men have 10 life-changing experiences. And the Bible says all 10 are healed, but one returns to praise. One returns to thank God. Each of these people have reason to be thankful, but one takes the time. All 10 have been blessed. One has gratitude. I bet you didn't know this, but there are instructions for leprosy in Leviticus 14. Very interesting instructions. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. And then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take them who is to be cleansed, two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go out into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off his hair, bathe himself in water, and he will be clean. And after that, he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day, he shall shave off all the hair from his head, his beard, his eyebrows. 
He shall shave off his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. A lot, of, a lot of shaving going on there, right? But these verses are so far ahead of their time because they speak so beautifully of the work of the cross. For instance, the, the birds that they use in this ceremony are sparrows. And if you remember Jesus speaking about sparrows, they're, they're worthless, right? They're the least thought of bird. And that reminds us that Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus made himself nothing before he went to the cross, that he might save us. Another interesting point is that there's two sparrows. One sparrow is killed in an earthen vessel over running water, and his blood is sprinkled on the leper and also the other sparrow, and that living sparrow is set free which reminds us that God placed himself in an earthen vessel and his blood was sprinkled over us. And just like that second bird, we are now free. It's even symbolic that the sacrifice sparrow's blood is mixed with water. Because when Christ died, a Roman soldier pierced his side and out came blood and water. Our Thanksgiving story from Luke tells us that there's 10 lepers, they're healed by Jesus. But the thing is, you know, when you think about the story as a whole, it's not really about a healing. I mean, that's, that's part of the story, but it's not the main story. The real story is about the one leper who comes back to say thank you. And even as we consider the gratitude that is expressed by this leper, it also seems that what Jesus really wants to teach us here is a lesson about faith. Because the healing story falls in Luke's gospel, and we are here to learn that to have faith is to live it. And to live it is to give thanks. Right? Jesus said to the one who thanked him, rise and go your way. What? Your faith has made you well. Living a life of gratitude, this is the sort of faith that heals this man. So I think Jesus wants us to see that faith and gratitude are actually connected. Because to practice gratitude is to practice faith. If faith is not something we have, but it's something that we do, if it's a way we live, then by living, we express complete trust in God and we offer all of our thanks to God. But it's not always that easy, is it? Because not everything in our life goes good. So doubt creeps in and we begin to wonder how, how do we have faith when things go bad? And maybe that's why those nine lepers didn't return to Jesus to give thanks. Perhaps they were still doubting. And we've all been there, right? A family member is taken away tragically, or we, we lose our job, or your child is diagnosed with something terminal. And it feels like the foundation of our lives is just ripped out from underneath us. But to that, the Bible would say, give thanks in all circumstances. That's what the story of the healing of these 10 lepers is all about, because, you know, we think, well, of course, the one is grateful. He's healed. His life got better. It's always easy to give thanks when your life gets better. Yeah, but here's the thing. That one leper wasn't truly healed until he returned to give thanks to Christ. Only then does it say, your faith has made you well. And, and the real lesson is that faith can make us well, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of loss. And yes, our faith may waver at times, but to that, the Bible says, be thankful anyway. Because there is so much to thank God for, right? There is a French proverb 
that says gratitude is the memory of the heart. And I think as we remember how far we've fallen in sin, how we, far we've risen in Christ, the heart is moved to gratitude. The book of Psalms says something similar. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Gratitude, truly, is the memory of the heart. And if we're not expressing daily gratitude at the blessings we receive, it's because then our heart memory is so short. See, it's so very easy to get caught up in the trials of life that we lose a sense of perspective. We can be surrounded by blessings every day, but the majority of people would rather focus on the things that cause them discomfort rather than on all the things they have to be thankful for. Benjamin Franklin once said, contentment makes poor men rich and discontentment makes rich men poor. There's a lot of truth in that. Think of how many people you know who appear to have so very much, but who are miserable. Why is that? But this one leper, this one of 10, whose, whose life was touched was different. He came back, he gave thanks, he praised the Lord. Many of our lives have been changed and we ought to be living with this same Thanksgiving, not just this one weekend a year, but each and every day. In fact, an attitude that expresses this gratitude ought to be the distinguishing marker between Christians and the rest of the world. Because we have been healed. We have been delivered. We have been saved from something so much worse than leprosy. We have been delivered from sin. We have been redeemed from the wrath of God. We have received the Spirit of God. We have become a new creation. Remember, an heir, an adopted child in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Christians should be the most thankful people on the planet. So let's do two things, okay? First, let's think of God's blessings. What do, I, what do I mean think? I read somewhere that our English words for think and thank are actually related. They come from a similar root, meaning they're connected to one another. To live with thanksgiving, we first need to think of God's blessings in our lives, to look at them, to remember, and to name them, because gratitude is memory of the heart, right? Second, we should thank God for his blessings. We ought to be content with what we have. Rather than constantly grasping at all the things that we don't have, we, we need to learn contentment. And if we can do that, we will be so much closer to that goal in our, uh, the first verse we read about being thankful in all circumstances. Philippians 4 says, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. It says God will provide your needs, right? He does not owe you a bigger house or a newer car or a faster computer or whatever your, your desire might be. God does not owe us anything. He has already given us the greatest gift possible. When you sit down to a meal, we give thanks for the food that we are about to receive, but how much of that is habit over actual gratitude? Because truth is, most of us just rattle off a prayer because we've always done that. And there's always food there. We don't know what it's like. We don't know what it's like to wonder where our next meal is coming from or, or if we're, we'll be able to feed our kids that day. If we really knew what that feeling was like, then I think we'd be even more grateful. If you have plenty, it is because of the grace of God who has enabled you to work. God helped you develop those skills. God has maintained your health. Whatever it might be that he has helped you with, he has helped you fill those cupboards with food. And if you have even a little, it is still God that has given you enough to meet your needs. 
You have a roof over your heads. You have food on the table. Even if, even if there isn't food in the cupboard, you have clothes to wear among many other things. Let's not take all those things for granted. But what if you forget? What if you are like the nine and you forget? What if I were like them? I want to close with this poem that I found. It says, God, what if I forgot to say thank you for the food that you gave me to eat? I haven't missed a meal unintentionally for some 55 years now. I look into my kitchen cupboards. They are overflowing with cans and boxes and bags of food. And I glibly proclaim that there is nothing to eat. And I complain. God, what if I forgot to say thank you? Would you use that to make those cupboards empty, to teach my family what it learns to be hungry? What if I forgot to say thank you for the air I breathe? Would you see to it that I suffocated? What if I forgot to say thank you for water that's pure and clean, water that quenches my thirst, running out of my kitchen tap on demand? Would you see to it that I would learn to thirst by making me walk miles to carry water to my home? Would you see to it that the lakes and streams that I love to fish in and swim in would become rivers of sludge? What if I forgot to say thank you, Lord, for warmth? Would you let my furnace die? Would you let my house become cold? Would you let the sun burn out? Would you let the world become a frozen wasteland? What if I forgot to say thank you, Lord, for my house, for my comfortable place to live? Would you see to it that my family were thrown out into the streets and exposed to the elements? What if I forgot to say thank you, Lord, for work, for a job that gives me not only a paycheck but a purpose? Would you make me unemployed, begging for money for my family? What if I forgot to say thank you, Lord, for recreation, for play, for toys? Would you then arrange to have my golf club stolen, my camper destroyed, my fishing and hunting gear lost? And what if I forgot to thank, thank you, Lord, for wild things? for the deer, for pheasants, for trout, for grouse, for squirrels, for turkeys, for songbirds? Would you take them away from me and would you make the woods and the waters a desolate, quiet place if I forgot to say thank you? What if I forgot to say thank you for my children, for the miracle that they are? Would you take them away from me? Would you turn my joy into chaos? Would you turn my home into a solemn, quiet place? What if I forgot to say thank you for my wife, who loves me like no other, who regards me worthy of sharing her life, would you take her away from me if I forgot to say thank you? What if I forgot to say thank you, Lord, for parents who loved me and raised me into adulthood with patience and tender perseverance? Would you erase their memory from me? What if I forgot to say thank you for neighbors who care about me, who watch out for what is mine and who put up with my failings and accept me for who I am? Would you take them away from me? Would you set me down in hostile and unfamiliar places if I forgot to say thank you? And Lord, what if I forgot to say thank you for this life with all of its victories and all of its defeats? What if I forgot to say thank you for loving me into existence and for watching over me every day as a mother watches over her babies? Would you erase my life? Would you take it away from me and erase the memory of my existence? The answer, of course, is no. You would not punish me for thanklessness. No, instead, you would continue to shower blessings on me every day. In fact, more blessings than I can begin to count. In spite of that, so often, I do forget to say thank you. And to that, Lord, is precisely why I owe you my thanks. Let's pray. Lord, today we say thank you. Even though yesterday we may have forgotten and tomorrow we may forget again, today we remember and we say thank you. Thank you for the blessings that you have blessed us with. You have provided us with 
more than we could ever imagine. You've surrounded us with people who always look out for us. You have given us family and friends who bless us every day with kind words, with actions. You have blessed us with people who lift us up. You help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe. You protect us from those things that seem to hurt others, and you help us make better choices and provide us with advisors to help us through life's difficult decisions. You speak to us in so many ways, and we always know you're there. Lord, we are so grateful for keeping those around us feel safe and loved. We hope that you provide us with the ability to sense, to show them every day how much they matter. We hope that you give us the ability to give to them the same kindness that they have given to us. Lord, I am extremely grateful for all the blessings in my life. And Lord, I pray that you remind me of just how blessed I am, that you'd never allow me to forget, to show my gratitude in prayer and return to acts of kindness. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, we hope you have a blessed holiday, a blessed Thanksgiving, and uh, are surrounded by family, friends, with loved ones. Of course, from now on, we are heading into the Christmas season. We'll be doing all of our, uh, our Advent services here at the church. We always have two services, one at 9.30 and one at 11. And you are more than welcome to come uh, to any one of those services. We would love to have you here to sing Christmas songs, to have a Christmas message. And we also have two Christmas concerts coming up where our choir will sing. Uh, there'll be an evening Saturday concert and an evening Sunday concert, and you're invited to those as well. And then we'll have two services on Christmas Eve, one in the morning and one at night. They're completely identical. Please come to the one that suits your schedule the best. I love you guys. Have a great holiday.